Jesus Rodriguez miscalculated. The moment his head struck the bottom of the pool, his body went numb. Struggling to keep water out from his lungs, he rose to the surface and screamed for his son, who called EMS and brought him to the emergency room. I met Jesus on a warm summer day in Springfield, Massachusetts in the year 2000 at Bay State Medical Center. I was one month into my practice. He was a C4 quadriplegic. He had a fracture dislocation of his neck and I took him immediately to the operating room, reduced his fracture, fused his spine, and brought him to the ICU. His chances of recovery were one in a thousand. Two days later though, miraculously, he began wiggling his fingers. And two weeks later, he walked out of the hospital. There was a picture on the front page of the Springfield Times with me walking out with Jesus and it landed on my desk with my colleague's note on top of it. He wrote on top, what's this, McLaughlin saves Jesus? <laughs> I wrote a little note under it and returned it to his desk. I wrote, never underestimate the arrogance of a neurosurgeon. <laughs> About a week later, a young boy came to my emergency room. He was an eight-year-old boy with black curly hair and a high cheekbone. He looked the spitting image of his, of his father. He had fallen off the school bus steps and cut his face. But mom and dad were at his bedside and they said, Dr. McLaughlin, something's really wrong. Our boy who works at our pizza parlor down the street, he's dropping plates. He's acting like he's drunk. He's sleeping all the time. A quick CAT scan and an MRI scan diagnosed him with a large posterior fossa tumor, a tumor in the back of the head pressing on his brainstem. He needed a perfect operation. I took him to the operating room the next day, and over a course of eight hours, I opened his skull, got around a very angry and bloody tumor, and shaved the last bit of it off of his brainstem. Eight hours later, I returned him to the ICU. He woke up perfectly for about 24 hours, and then complications set in. I'm going to come back to Anthony. Today we're going to talk about fear. Fear has been around all of our lives ever since we were little kids, ever since we were worried about the monsters under the bed, right? And then as we got older, we realized the monsters weren't under the bed. They were outside in front of us and they were in our head. It's a universal emotion. We all experience this. It's emotion is the same whether you're on deck for a wrestling match or you're in the biggest business deal of your life, whether you're facing a difficult operation or a dangerous health situation. And as we grow, we've got to figure out a way to deal with it constructively if we want our best performance. How? Well, one thing's for sure. We can't banish it. A certain amount of fear makes us rise to the occasion. It's a key ingredient. It's a recipe for the peak performance. And too much can paralyze us. I want everybody to close their <laughs> eyes for a minute. Close your eyes and think about what you fear. Do you have a child with an addiction? Do you worry about losing a parent? Or passing away with unfinished business or unsaid words? Every one of us experiences fear in different ways, and it's deeply personal. My answer to fear is something I've learned over my career, and it's a concept called cognitive dominance. Cognitive dominance defined is enhanced situational awareness in order to facilitate rapid and accurate decision-making under stressful conditions with limited decision-making time. It's a concept I stumbled on when I was giving lectures up at West Point for a class called The Psychology of Elite Performance. When I heard one of the cadets mention it, I thought, wow, what is that? How do I get more of that? And what gets in the way of cognitive dominance? And after a lot of thought and research, I realized that in order to function from a perspective of cognitive dominance, one needs to commit to three actions. And they are lifelong learning, consilience, 
and maximizing your platform. Learning, not only because it's healthy, but because it makes life interesting. Consilience, which draws from different scientific disciplines and puts our feet on firmer ground. And maximizing the power of our platforms by reaching our maximum potential and always trying to get to the next level. So first, lifelong learning. Something which you're all doing today. I took a deep dive into the performance enhancement literature and I studied and reflected on my last 28 years of education in neurosurgery and my career. And I decided I could leverage my background and my experience in neurosurgery to think about cognitive dominance and its relationship to fear. So the first article I came across was an article written by Malcolm Gladwell in the New Yorker by a then relatively unknown Malcolm Gladwell. And he talked about three virtuosos, Yo-Yo Ma, Lane Gretzky, and a neurosurgeon by the name of Charlie Wilson. Charlie Wilson is one of the most prolific, profound neurosurgeons uh, in the history of neurosurgery. He had amazing skills and was trained a generation of neurosurgeons. And what Matt Gladwell found was they had three things in common. First, they had an efficiency of movement. They wasted no energy. They got right to the heart of every matter they needed to immediately without any extra motion. Second, they had the ability to chunk information, assimilate large amounts of information, and recognize patterns quickly so that they could execute immediately, much like a batter has to make a split-second decision on a 100-mile-an-hour fastball. And lastly, and I found this to be the most interesting, he found that they were obsessed with the possibility and the factors associated with failure. Here are virtuosos who you would think are on autopilot all the time. They're obsessed with failure and how to avoid it and how to outthink it. In this article, it sort of led into Gladwell's book, Outliers, which talked about the 10,000 hour rule. And what he said was, and he took this from Anders Ericsson's literature, that a person to become an expert in anything needed 10,000 hours. Unfortunately, it was a little bit misinterpreted. It's not only 10,000 hours. Erickson talked about this. And what he said was 10,000 hours of raw experience. And then you also needed mentor practice and solo practice to become an expert. So as I began to think about cognitive dominance and how could I achieve this or point towards, I had to reflect on my career. I didn't know it. I wanted to be a physician ever since I was a kid. I used to carry my grandfather's black bag on house calls, but I didn't know it was going to take me 40,000 hours to learn to become a neurosurgeon. That's internship, residency, and fellowship. I'd spend another 50,000 in my 20-year career. Over the last 28 years, I've been on call nine years. That's carrying a pager, walking around, getting ready to drop everything at the drop of a hat to go save somebody's life. And I estimate I've seen over 140,000 patients. Now these numbers, they're not even that large. An average internal medicine doctor may see two or three or four times this number. As a surgeon, I spend a lot of my time in the operating room. But I've also, after 28 years, realized that I've made over 30,000 critical decisions. Decisions on whether to operate or not operate. Decisions on whether to, whether to pull a drain or leave it in another day risking a person's fluid buildup and requiring another surgery. Decisions whether to intervene or not intervene. Doctors make these decisions all the time. I've spent 250,000 hours taking a 75,000 RPM drill to the skull and another 1,400 hours shaving and sculpting bone spurs off of the central nervous system and the spinal canal. And all of those actions and all of those functions make you function in a certain way. This is a kerosene rangeur. It's a, it's a bone biting instrument where this, this handle is closed and the mouth of this instrument closes on a bone spur. I've pulled this trigger over a million times. And if it's a millimeter to the right or a millimeter to the left in the wrong direction or a millimeter deep or a millimeter shallow and I pull up somebody's nerve root, I change their life forever. And some might say, well, when you do these repetitive motions, when you're an expert, you get used to it. Not me, not good surgeons. Every time we close an instrument, we are thinking, what is between these scissors? 
Never cut what you can't see. It's a principal tenant, tenant in surgery. Pulling that trigger, drilling that bone, making those decisions, they turn you into a, a decision-making, thinking, concentrating machine. The brain is an experience-dependent organ. But you can't just be a machine. You've got to talk to patients and families and experience the unfolding of some very sad life events. One of the most difficult things neurosurgeons do is deliver bad news. I've estimated, well, I've spoken to over 2,000 families telling them their loved one's going to pass away, has a malignant brain tumor, or they're going to be paralyzed. And probably another thousand telling them their loved one's going to survive, but they'll never be the same. Medicine does a great job in teaching physicians and nurses how to treat diseases, but we are not trained well in how to deal with the emotions that affect us, emotions that affect our minds. It's clear to me that two of the biggest occupational hazards of neurosurgery are key detractors in human performance, and that is fear and grief. I'm comforted by the Nietzsche quote, anyone can endure a what? as long as you have a why. One of the ways I've been able to cope with my experience is my why. Why did I want to write a book? There were already plenty of memoirs out there about medicine, beautiful books by Henry Marsh and Atul Gawande. I wanted more. I wanted to write a book that said, this is what I've learned from all this stress. This is what I've learned, how I apply it in my life, how it's transferable to business and parenting and every other aspect of your life. That was my goal. And what I learned from this stress, is that fear is universal. And we'll talk more about it. I'd like to do a little exercise. I'm going to have a little public speaking exercise here. You know, they say that public speaking is one of the highest concerns on people's list of worries. It, they say that it's even higher than death, as you can see here. People would rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy, right? All right, so in 30 seconds, I'm going to pick a random person in the audience, and I'm gonna ask you to come up here and speak about a topic you know very little about. I'll whisper it in your ear, okay? And I know that some of you are thinking, oh, if I, if I don't look at him, if I don't look at him, he won't pick me. Well, you're wrong. And some of you are thinking, well, I'm going to look at him defiantly, and he won't pick me. And you're wrong. Are you ready? I'm just kidding. I'm not going to ask you. <laughs> but didn't you feel a little sweat on your palms? Didn't you feel a little stress? I had the privilege of interviewing Sanjay Gupta for this book. And uh, when I talked with him, I said, we're ta I'm, I'm talking about the fear that surgeons experience. It's something that surgeons don't talk about. And Sanjay said to me, Mark, I don't experience fear. I think, I don't know, I think you may have it wrong here. I have stress. I, I get nervous sometimes. But I mean, nobody's shooting at me, right? I interview people out in mass units that are getting shot at when they're operating. I, I get to go home at the end of my surgeries. So it made me really think, how do I... How do we really drill down on this word fear, and how do we define it properly? Because to me, I think fear, stress, anxiety, I think they're all part of the same spectrum. So I met with my co-author, and we spent an entire day just talking about the definition of fear. And we, we each came up with our own definitions. Mine was the anticipation of not performing to my highest standards, of harming someone because I was not properly prepared. And he defined it, Sean, my co-writer, defined it as a neurological response to an unexpected event that triggers the neg a, a negative emotional response. A neurological response to an unexpected event that triggers a negative emotional response. It's interesting. Mine was internal, his external. So we decided to unpack this word some more. And we came up with something called the gradient of fear. So what we did is we asked ourselves, when do we not experience fear? When are we not having any thought of fear? And when do we get a little fear? When do we get a lot? So first of all, I think it's triggered by two events. It's either the anticipation 
of an unexpected event or the actual drop-in of an unexpected event. For instance, you hear some rustling outside your back door and you might get a little nervous, but then the door gets kicked in and you've got an intruder in your house. That's real fear. What about when you're not experiencing fear? Well, we do have that. We have these experiences where we're homeostatic, nothing bad, nothing good, we're just sort of moving along. Sometimes we're actually in this great experience of, of securedness or even transcendence. That's when we're not experiencing fear. But the moment we start to anticipate something <coughs> happening, we begin to fall into this fear, this fear spectrum. And then once there's an actual event that drops into our lives, then we can experience fear, terror, panic, horror. And down at the bottom, I put fate worse than death, F-W-T-T. <laughs> and I can, I can promise you as a neurosurgeon, there are fates worse than death. There are devastating strokes that create locked-in syndromes and, and aphasia and inability to function. So there are things out there that are worse than death. So let's shift gears a little bit. This is Paul Broca. He was a neuro uh, French physician uh, in the 18th century, 19th century, and he had a patient uh, present to him that had no speech. Uh, when they passed away, they succumbed to their disease, he dissected their brain, and he noted that their left frontal lobe had an infarct, had a stroke. He was the first person who mapped the anatomy of speech, where it existed in the brain. And then over the course of another 100 years, many other very elegant scientists mapped out the different parts of the brain, where it controls your arm and your leg and your sight and your speech. All of those things got mapped out. But we are now in a revolution, a breakthrough. One block away, there's a functional MRI scan that can define where your thoughts are. We're talking about the physiology of thought and emotion. We've gone from mapping brain anatomy to pinpointing thoughts and emotions, like fear, where they actually live in the brain. It's revolutionized cognitive neurosciences. We're now mapping the exact neuroanatomy of fear, and we've discovered a network, a conglomerate of cells that form a web of activity, which we experience when we have an unexpected event. We're beginning to understand how it works. And as I thought about more, I had sort of a Pavlovian thought. And that was, there's a stimulus, which is some type of unexpected event. And then there's a response, fear. But fear is just the alarm bell. It's not the situation or the solution. To me, fear is a messenger. It's a signpost that says, pay attention. There's something important up ahead. There's something meaningful up ahead. And you care about it. We've cut a thick path through literature and science, and it leads me to my next topic, consilience, the next action that you need to take to become more cognitively dominant. There is growth in minds, and ideas come together. It may help with this, may not help with this particular case, but if you have new knowledge, you can use it in the future. I was a philosophy major at William & Mary, and I thought that marrying the humanities and sciences would make me a better physician be able to relate to people better. And as I read and reflect on my career, I realized I could leverage my knowledge base in neurosurgery, and I thought I could marry it, the science with the humanities. This is a good start, masterpiece by Edward Wilson called Consilience, which defines the synthesis of thought. What he talks about is that we and the world benefit by employing multiple ways of thinking. They'll stand on firmer ground. For instance, Descartes, who married algebra and geometry, or uh, Darwin, who married Mendelian genetics with his theory of evolution. And probably the best example is Albert Einstein, who proved relativity with astronomy, physics, and math. Those are examples of taking two sciences, putting them together, and making something stronger and more knowledgeable. So I took a page from a book called Maps of Meaning by Jordan Peterson. This is a figure, and I thought, I really wanted to think about cognitive dominance, I had to focus on how the world works. And this is probably the most simplistic diagram you could have on how the world works. We're all in a state of what is. We're navigating the world on our way to what we, what we want, what should be, what we believe we want to go to. And along the way, events happen. We're performing actions towards our goal, and events happen. 
That's how life works. And we grow in strength and in proportion to those challenges that we're confronted with. So one of the things Jordan Peterson talked about was uh, Carl Jung's studies, a Swiss psychologist. And Jung talked a lot about these events, these unexpected events that land in our lives. And he believed that they were transformational. They could make or break us. Just like a ray of sunlight coming down and, and make, turning a snowflake into water or turning a, a chlorophyll into energy in a leaf, that photon can be creative or destructive. And he studied the alchemaic literature, which is over 8,000 years old. We all think of alchemists as crazy scientists that wanted to turn lead into gold. But really, when Jung described it, he thought they were onto something metaphysically, that there were also transformational events in life that took us from one space and put us in a much higher level, a much higher plane. So let's drill down on this a little bit. As we're going along in life, we're in a what, is, what is and we're going to what should be. We experience these different events. Sometimes these events, these unexpected events, give us hope. We get a handle on them. They, we, can, we can control them and they project us towards our goal. And that's when we experience hope. And then sometimes these unexpected events land in our laps and we have to rethink what's going on. And that's when we experience fear. And this is really the heart of what cognitive dominance is. It's figuring out what to do when unexpected events throw us for a loop and we don't know what to do. There's three things, in my opinion, there's three things you need to do to unpack these events, to dissect them and figure them out. You can literally map this out. The first decision you need to make is, what are the objective and subjective components of this event? So for instance, this is a glass of water. Objectively, it's 500 cc's. It's devoid of bacteria. It's got a temperature of 98.4, and it's contained in a clear container. Now we could take this glass of water anywhere in the world and every scientist would describe it exactly the same. That's the matter of the world. But there's also a what matters in the world. So the subjective value of this glass of water is very different for everybody. For us, we've had water maybe an hour ago. It doesn't mean that much to us. It's not that important. But what if we lived in a village where potable water was, was two miles away? It had great importance. Or if we were in the desert for two days, we didn't have access to water, it would be critically important, wouldn't it? Young thought that if there's a periodic table of what, if there's a periodic table of matter in the world, there's probably a periodic table of what matters in the world too. So next we need to decide, well is this event a potential tool to help me get to where I wanna be, or is it an obstacle? And of course, as we all know, sometimes obstacles are tools in disguise and vice versa. And then lastly, if we can decide what, are, what do we truly know about this event and what is completely unknown to us? If we can answer these three questions and really dissect out those events in those, with those three lenses, we're, we're on our way to mapping a pathway to figuring out and outthinking fear. So let me give you an example. This is Santiago Ramoni Cajal who was a rambunctious kid, got in a lot of trouble as a kid, wanted to be an artist, but his father insisted that he become a doctor. So he put him in medical school and he became a neuropathologist. He began studying um, all, all aspects of cells and he had these beautiful drawings. He would take his picture from the microscope and he would draw these amazingly beautiful um, uh, photo, uh, paintings of, of cells. Uh, nerves, uh, muscle tissue, fatty tissue. He made beautiful paintings of everything. But he was struggling because he wanted to study the nervous system better and he didn't have a really good staining technique. 1887 rolls along and his friend returns from an Italian conference. He's got slides from Emilio Golgi. Remember Golgi bodies in high school class? Golgi bodies. So Emilio Golgi had a silver impregnation technique. And he looks at it and in one instance sees the beautiful outline of a neuron. And he's uh, awestruck by it. Oh my gosh, here's a transformational event in, in his life where he wants to learn more about the nervous system. He's had struggling with the objective aspects of his trade. And now he gets a breakthrough with a silver impregnation technique that can help him see the neurons. 
he works on Golgi's technique and perfects it, he starts defining the neurons in ways that people have never seen before. And he realizes that neurons are connected. And 1906 wins the Nobel Prize for defining the synapse. Here's a transformational event that changes our world forever. Think of the pharmacology. Think of the neuroanatomy. Think of the neurosciences that have changed because of that one event. So as I said, I like to pick things apart, dissect them, and map them out. So what if we took these transformational events and went back to a Cartesian coordinate system? Remember Descartes? He married algebra and geometry. What if we could marry mathematics with humanities here? So what if we put on the x-axis the objective components of an event, and on the y-axis we put the subjective components of an event? Sometimes they're a little bit positive, sometimes they're a lot positive. And similarly with objective findings as well. Remember though, Cartesian coordinate system has four quadrants, right? You've got the positive positives, and then you've got the negative negatives, and you've got the partly positives and partly negatives. So if we could map this out, what would it look like? Well, first of all, remember that gradient of fear? What if we could map the gradient of fear onto this co Cartesian coordinate system? Whenever something's doubly positive, we're going to be in that secure, confident, assured, certain zone, right? This is doubly positive. That's exactly how we feel when events are subjectively and objectively positive, when they're a tool, not an obstacle, and when we know about them. That's exactly what that is. And then sometimes we're in the awful situation where something is subjectively negative for us and it's also objectively negative. We get a terrible diagnosis in a loved one. Objectively negative, subjectively negative. Falls into the lower quadrant and the in-betweens. So again, if we put objective along the x-axis and subjective along the y-axis, we added an extra plus or minus if it's known or unknown, because if something's known, it's going to help us. If something's unknown, it may or may not help us. And we could actually map out fear. So let's go to Ramoni, Santiago Ramoni Cajal. What happens? He subjectively wants to learn more about the nervous system, he objectively sees a discovery that's going to help him visualize the nervous system for the whole world. And he, know, he he's a trained neuropathologist, so he knows staining techniques so he can make it even better. Ramoni Call lands in the highest quadrant you could possibly get. Doubly positive on both aspects and known. So I call this the flow quadrant. This is where nothing is going wrong. You actually, everything that comes your way is exactly what you need, and you jump on it. But sometimes, we don't have something that's positive. We have something that's subjectively negative, objectively positive. Like, we get a job promotion, but then we realize our, the new boss is a real problem. <laughs> right? So, objectively positive, subjectively negative, right? Or, somebody who loves us betrays us, and we have both subjective and objective negativity. That's, a, that's what I call the all is lost quadrant. And then sometimes we get dealt something that we think is bad or it's somewhat bad and we figure out a way to make it good. And I call that the birthing a new skill set quadrant. And this is a pathway that we all experience in life. It's called the heroic journey. It's been defined in literature for thousands of years. And it doesn't always follow in this nice clockwise path fashion. Sometimes you drop from flow right down into all is lost. And you can sometimes rise above. But it is a pathway that we all find on our lives. Which leads me last to the third act that one needs to pursue to become cognitive dominant, cognitively dominant. And that is to maximize and build your platform. Everyone in this room has a amazingly strong and sturdy platform, and you can work on it more. Which brings me back to my book. As I was writing this book and trying to sell it to agents and publishers, I was asked, Dr. McLaughlin, what's your platform? I had never heard the word platform <laughs> used in that. I had never heard it used in that, in that format before, you know? But really, there was, who are your influencers? How many Instagram followers do you have? How many Facebook? I said, I don't have any of that. I mean, I know fear because I've been experiencing it for 28 years, but my platform is an academic, 
neurosurgeon, private practice neurosurgeon who has an academic uh, interest. And around the same time I was struggling to get somebody interested in this concept, my personal trainer dropped off at my house these platforms, these risers. He said, I want you to start lifting weights and doing these step ups. Get up, stretch your leg, get up, stretch your leg. So I'm doing these exercises and I'm thinking platform and I got my art artist hat on. I'm like thinking about platforms and platforms are a metaphor, right? They help us understand science better. It's humanities and sciences coming together to understand the world better. It's a great example of consilience. And there are different kinds of platforms. We jump off the platform to get on a train, right? Your computer works on an operating platform. We speak on platforms to influence people. We launch rockets from platforms. Platforms are a metaphor. They enable human achievement. And as you know, I coach, oh, I work in the operating room and I need platforms to operate because I'm a short guy. And I need these platforms to see a different perspective and to, to do a, the job that I need to get done. And as, I, as, they to, as John told you, I, I coach a youth wrestling team. I love coaching wrestling because it is a laboratory for fear. If you want to experience fear, get on the side of the mat that you're going to wrestle somebody with and they look bigger and stronger and older than you. That's fear, and it's great talking with these kids and giving them the tools to unpack it, figure it out, and, and navigate with it. Well, all these kids, they wanna be on a platform too. Right? They wanna be on the top platform. So as I talk with them during the season, as I, what I said was, you see people on platforms, but you have to understand, you don't climb up on a platform, you build it layer by layer by layer. That's how one advances on their platform. So I brought these platforms in with some words on for my kids. I put the, put the, put the labels on my platforms and brought them in. These are the platforms of our good wrestler. You need to do your exercises and push-ups and sit-ups and drilling and conditioning and discipline and have put the right food in the tank. You gotta do the work. And I share with them that there is a platform of life. These are the things that a person, a virtuous person works on in their life to build them up. And everything you stack on that is gonna put you on a higher plane to see more, to achieve more. This is Olivia's platform. By the way, girls wrestling in Princeton is growing leaps and bounds. As I said to the kid, platforms are very personal, what you wanna work on, how you wanna build it. So she built this one for herself. We've got about 20 girl wrestlers on the Princeton youth team and 40 or so in Trenton now. And they're, they're really growing and there's gonna be a girls high school league very soon. It's a great sport for girls as, as well for boys. So it teaches self-determination, resilience, strength, self-defense. It's a great sport. These are the three risers that I work on all the time. I talk to my kids about it and share with you. This is, these are what I work on. We talk about lifelong learning. The greatest gift my father ever gave me was lifelong learning. This is my dad. Um, he, after a 40 year career in law, went back to Drew University and got a, two master's degrees and then a PhD in history. And um, then he began writing his first book, which he completed at the age of 83. And then he completed his second book at the age of 88. And, um, it really inspired me to, to, to read. And as, as you know, reading is critically important in our brain development. And now with functional MRI scans, we are seeing the anatomy of what reading does to the brain. It literally thickens cortical margins in the brain. It strengthens connectivity. And it's probably one of the best ways to prevent or minimize Alzheimer's disease because you're strengthening cortical networks. Every extra connection you have holds true. There are neuropathologists that look at brains that are atrophied and say, well, this person may have had Alzheimer's disease and families will say, no, they were, they were sharp as a tack. They're, the intellect that you take into old age is one of the only determinants that will help fight against Alzheimer's disease. And it's because of strengthened neural connectivity. There's numerous studies on this and truly the act of reading a book has specific anatomical determinants in your brain. That's why I focus with my kids on 
focusing on reading. Secondly, faith. This is something that I'm always working on. I had the privilege of hosting Olympic gold medalist Kyle Snyder two years ago. He came down and gave a free clinic in Trenton for my wrestlers. And it was thrilling to talk to this young man about how religion powered him, how it was so important and central in his life. And um, it is for me too. Before every operation, I have a routine. I call my five Ps. I pause, I think about this specific patient that I'm operating on, what their problem is and what they need done. I make a plan, I put out a positive thought, and I say a prayer. And skeptics might say, well, a prayer is not gonna affect the surgery, but it's always affecting me. It's always making me a better surgeon. And it's funny because I give this talk in scientific circles and I see some people get uncomfortable with the discussion of faith in a scientific lecture. And my answer is, first of all, faith doesn't have to be religious. The purest definition of faith is being on the right path. Being a part of a team is a true expression of faith. And it's healthy. There's abundant literature that shows Fewer hospitalizations, shorter hospitalizations if you have faith. Decreased incidence of heart disease, decreased incidence of hypertension, decreased incidence of depression. It is, it is a scientific fact that if you believe in something bigger, whatever that may be, you're healthier. These are some of my teams. This is my, this is my team that I walk into the OR with every day in my mind. This is my grandfather who was a physician, a surgeon in West Orange, New Jersey for 50 years. And my great uncle, a surgeon in West Orange as well. My two uncles, Francis Pitsy, who's a resident here, was served at Princeton Medical Center for over 25 years. And my uncle, Walter. Um, this is our newest generation, fourth generation physician, Connor, who's a, Connor McLaughlin is at Drexel. Uh, he graduates this year. This is another one of my teams. This is my team at Princeton Brain and Spine. And I have a, literally, a Rolodex of people that I can draw on either physically with a phone call or mentally, what would grandpa have done? That's a great feeling. That helps me. This picture I love, because this is Anne. She was born in Milburn, New Jersey uh, on June 1st, 1931 by Grandpa Pitsy on a house call. And she attends my father's World War II book club and I see her there regularly. <laughs> I want to just talk briefly about the science of forgiveness, and then I'll, I'll close with the story of Anthony. Um, so there's also a lot of science about forgiveness, that the act of forgiveness is actually healthy for your brain. It quiets neural chatter, and it strengthens connections. Which brings me back to Anthony. So as I told you, Anthony had a perfect operation, went to the ICU, and for 24 hours looked neurologically intact. Then I got a call from one of the nurses. Dr. McLaughlin, I need you to come right away. Anthony, there's something wrong with him. I can't explain it. Came to the bedside. He's shrieking at the top of his lungs. Shrieking every time we touch him. And every time we try to move him, he screams. Parents are there. Everybody in the ICU, what's going on? What's going on? I took him down for a scan. The MRI scan shows the tumor's all gone. Brainstem looks perfect. Perfect resection. Anthony is miserable. He developed something, a rare complication called cerebellar mutism, which is a very unusual complication in children after brain tumor surgery. And it's characterized by no movement and crying and shrieking and whininess. He had the worst case I'd ever seen and never heard of. I talked with all of my mentors. It lasted for months. And he suffered. A few days after he began shrieking, he developed a fluid buildup on the brain. I had to put a shunt in to bypass the fluid. Then the shunt got clogged. Then it got infected. Then his pathology came back, anaplastic ependymoma, not good, cancerous tumor. Then he got a wound infection. He <clears throat> suffered, 
so severely. And I felt this, I saw this beautiful boy slipping through my hands. Neurologically, he would lose, 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 lose. And for three months, it was a very, very difficult time for him and his mother and father. Well, he finally stabilized and he was ready to be discharged to rehab and um, he was gonna go get chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And his mom and dad were so nice to me and they, they said, we wanna get a picture of you with Anthony. So I dutifully stood by his bedside and leaned in like, I gotta be honest with you, I faked this smile. I faked it because there was nothing good coming to Anthony. He had suffered and he was gonna suffer more and his prognosis was dismal. So he left the hospital, but he never left me. That was when I started going on these long walks at night. An extra scotch, cigar, bad coping strategies. I just kept thinking like, what a capricious world this is. Why do I get to have a healthy eight-year-old boy in my home? And the Lacoris have this boy who's suffering, he's devastated, He'll never be the same. It was a very lonely time. I had no answers. I kept asking myself, could I have done the surgery quicker that would have prevented this? Could I have retracted less? Could I have, did I shave too much off of the brain stem? Could I have picked up the infection earlier? Could I have picked up the fluid buildup earlier? It was too much to handle. I ended up quitting pediatric neurosurgery. I couldn't bear to experience another Anthony. And I moved to New Jersey. Started a new practice. <laughs> Some people do serious things to get away from fear. <laughs> and then fast forward 15 years later, I'm in my office. I'm writing this book and I'm looking at the picture of Anthony on my wall. I put it up. I couldn't put that picture in a box. I needed that on the wall. And every time I walked by it, I was sad. But I realized I've got to figure out what happened to Anthony. I didn't know the end of the story. I had never found out. So I got on Facebook and sure enough, the pizza parlor is still there in Springfield, Massachusetts. And I scrolled down on the pictures and I saw Mr. and Mrs. LaCory, a little older, but that's them. I scrolled down a little farther and I saw a 24 year old man in a wheelchair mm. sitting next to his parents. Oh my God, Anthony's still alive. I couldn't believe it. I drove up that weekend to go see him. I went to the pizza parlor and I told mom and dad how I was writing this book. And I talked to Anthony, who is still significant, has significant neurological deficits. And I told his mom and dad how I had kept him with me at all times and how every time I thought of him, I was sad and how I felt like I had let them down. And they came around the table and they gave me this gigantic hug. They said, what are you talking about, Dr. McLaughlin? You're our hero. You saved our boy. He's still with us. He's still my number one guy in this restaurant. And they gave me another picture. They gave me this picture and a bunch of presents, a plant and a purse for my wife. And they said, here, we want you to have this. This was on our wall. And I had totally forgotten about this. This was... A, the day before I left Springfield, Massachusetts, we had dinner with the LaCoris at their restaurant. And this was the picture they had on their wall. Every time they walked by it, it made them happy. Every time I walked by my Anthony's picture, it made me sad. And as I got into my car and drove home that day, I said, oh my gosh, I had this all wrong. I was looking at Anthony down this telescope like this. And they just totally flipped it around so I could see the bigger picture. What a privilege it was for me to take care of Anthony. And I did my job. I released my gift. And he's still here on this earth. What a privilege it is to be a doctor. And I called my co-writer up and I said, hey, I, I, you're not going to believe this. And I told him the whole story. And he said, that's great. You know, we're, you got to write that. And we're going to put it in the chapter with Jesus. Rodriguez, and I said, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. Jesus, 
we got lucky with Jesus. He, you know, and that's a success story. And Anthony's not. It's a fail. It's, he said, Mark, you don't, you don't see it, do you? I said, what? I don't see what. He says, Mark, you take somebody who's paralyzed and you make them walk again and you say it's luck. And then you take a young boy who's got a terrible, devastating tumor and he doesn't do well and you say it's your fault. That is an impossible standard to live up to. Don't all of us set standards like that for ourselves? Don't all of us have experiences in our life that we won't forgive ourselves for? Well, I tell you, when I got into my car and I drove home, I forgave myself and I grew because when you forgive yourself, you grow. And now, when I walk past that picture in my office, that smile's real. <clears throat> Anthony, unfortunately, is not a wrestling fan. He likes professional wrestling, but he doesn't like real wrestling. But to tie things together, I want to go back to the Descartes, the Cartesian coordinate system, and talk about this. What first happened to me was this. I thought I was gonna finish my training, go out there and be this neurosurgeon and feel great, save lives. And this was gonna be, once I got done with my training and all that tough stuff, I'm just gonna have a great life. And what happened? I took care of this young boy and I thought, oh, I'm not supposed to feel like this. I feel terrible, I'm gonna crawl under a rock. This is miserable. I, I trained my whole life to, to feel this. And I fell from the calm before the storm to the all is lost. And that, in that story, in that moment that I kept telling myself, I was in the all is lost phase for 15 years until I started writing a book. And I realized, and I went up to talk to them, and I birthed this new skill set. And once I talked to them and got this through my system and figured it out and got the perspective and stopped telling myself a single story, I went into flow again. And I became a much better doctor because of that experience. So I hope today's talk today was transformational for you. I hope that if you can focus on lifelong learning, consilience, and maximizing your platform, you too can steer towards cognitive dominance. Thank you.